Hey kids. It's so good to, uh, to be here with you again. I don't really get to see you, but I know you're there, you're watching. We're up to lesson 38, the mystery is solved. So all the things that we looked at all during the year have all accumulated into this one lesson 38. So there's two more, so there's 40 lessons. So before we get going and see what the answers to all the questions are, let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come together today in the name of Jesus Christ to thank you, Lord, for everything you've given us. Open up your word, open up our heart to receive it, and allow us to learn at least one brand new thing about you, Lord, about what you have done through your son, Jesus, and what Jesus, what you've done for us in the Holy Spirit. So thank you for all the things that you've given us, especially your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray and thank you. Amen. So if you don't have your Bibles, uh, you can pause the video, go grab them again. Like I always say, just grab your Bibles. It's so much better when you read it from the Bible than just listening to me read it. You can always pause it. That's always a good thing. So, oops, let's go back to our previous one. So what we have here is who, what, when, where, and why. So during the year, we've gone through the questions. So we still need two more, the one at the beginning and the one at the end. So those two bookends. So what happened? Well, Jesus was uh, sacrificed by, he gave his life for us, for the, the um, forgiveness of our sins. When did it happen? It happened a while ago, 2,000 years ago, during the, uh, the Passover feast. Where did it happen? Just outside the city of Jerusalem. We know those details. So we've seen all those things throughout the year. Now the last questions are, who did it and why it happened? So let's start with why. So I want you guys to look for Galatians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. So let's read it. I have it here. But again, you can look for it. You pause it. And then once you find it, we'll keep you read along with me. All right. I got my Bible right here. And Galatians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. You can check the screen if you forget like me. It says this. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So we're going to look at the new covenant. Now Galatians starts us off by saying that in the past we were given the laws that kept us kind of captive. But in a way it says the law was our guardian or our teacher. So I put a picture of a, just a generic school teacher. So it kept us on the path that we should follow. It led us the way that we should be doing. So it taught us how we should live and how the people sorry, how the people of Israel should live and what they should be doing. And God gave them that law through Moses. Remember that. So it kept them on a good path for what they should be doing. So that was good. Then we're going to look at what was best. I put a picture here of uh, just an illustration of Adam and Eve. And you can see they're being, they're, they don't look like they're too happy. They're wearing clothing. Well, the clothing made of sheepskin, no wool. So what happened here is you remember back when we started, we learned about coverings. Now the slide says God made a way to cover the sin of his people. Now this was a physical covering that took way back in the time of Adam and Eve. So they had made themselves, once they sinned, they realized what was right and wrong. They recognized that they had no clothes on, so they were ashamed and they made themselves a covering. It was a good covering. It was fig leaves, so it wasn't very, very good, but it was, it was okay. It was a good covering, but God gave them a better covering. So as you can see, an animal had to be killed and God made them those clothes, so that was much better, but we needed something what was best. So we had good, better, and the best covering of our sin, we're going to look at the next slide. So what was the best covering for our sin? So that was an external covering. But what Adam and Eve and what we all need is the internal covering of the problem that's inside, the sin that is inside. That was just the problem on the outside that was solved by the Lord. But now we need something that would cover us from the inside problem, and that is sin. So if you want to remember sin, it starts with an S, it ends with an N, and I am in the middle. I'm in the middle of the sin. So it's it's part of who I am as a human being, but I know that my sins have been covered by the solution, which is Jesus. So God provided the perfect lamb to be sacrificed. And the, who that is, that's Jesus. Second Corinthians 5.21. Let's see what it says. Second Corinthians 5.21, it says this. 
For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus did not sin throughout his life. He didn't sin, but was made sin so that he could die for us. So God provided the perfect lamb. Remember in our, in our previous lessons, he was a, the high priest and he was the lamb, the lamb of God, the high priest of God. So he offered up himself as an offering and sacrifice. And therefore we are able now to be covered by what? Not by externally, that problem was solved way back and we still have that covering. But now the internal problem of sin, the center of it all was covered by his blood, right? By his death and his resurrection. So God made Jesus to be sin for us. Then God put to death his one and only son whom he loves. So it was God. It was God who gave his son, so he offered him. And let's look at that in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10a. So most of you boys and girls know that Isaiah 53, verse 10a. It was part of our memory verses. And it says right here, uh, Isaiah 53, verse 10, the first part. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He, was put him, he has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. So it was the will of the Lord, God the Father, to crush him or to put him to death, as we see here. And yes, to put him to grief or to put him to death. So it was, the, it was God the Father who made that decision. So here we have the mercy of the Lord where we have God's love for us that he gave his son. We're going to look at a little later on. But also the obedience of Lord Jesus, his son, to obey that. So he says, here I am, send me. So he sent Jesus to die on the cross for the covering of our sins, a perfect sacrifice of that perfect, beautiful lamb who is Lord Jesus, who had no sin of him, but was made sin for our love and so that we may be forgiven of our sins. So now we have the solution to the original problem. So who did it? It was God our Father. Why? So that we might be forgiven. So what we have here is by his death, Jesus heals his sinful people and delivers them from death into eternal life. By his death, Jesus and his resurrection, remember, he heals his sinful people and delivers them from death into eternal life. Romans 8, verses 1 to 8. What does it say? Romans 8, verse 1 to 8. Let me see what we got here. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. I'll read it again. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So now we have been set free or here in our slides as delivers, right? It has set us free. From that, from the law of sin, the internal struggle, that the problem, that now we have been covered, and so the sin of death, because the wages of sin is death. So as sin entered into us, so death now is part of us. That's what it was. But then we no longer are afraid of having an eternal death and being um, fallen short of the glory of God forever, because now Jesus has given his life, so God offered up his son, he is the perfect lamb. He died to cover up our sins by his blood, which was shed. And that's the seal we're going to look at later. So we have been freed. We know the truth, as the Bible says, and it has set us free from this. The truth of who Jesus is, the truth of what Jesus did, the truth of what we have done. So we have to understand what we have done and that what we deserve. But then we understand that truth, the truth of the gospel. The Bible says your word is truth. So this is the truth, and the truth is very powerful. So it's very, very powerful. Once we know the truth, that will set us free. So I put a little picture there. You've seen that past in those videos. Of the parents, they're reading the Bible, and the little boy is kind of pointing at himself. Yeah, that applies to you too. So let's go to Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. Matthew chapter 26, 
verse 28, the everlasting covenant seal. I don't know if you remember, boys and girls, way back when we were at the church, uh, Miss Elaine showed us pictures, remember, of the seal and the animal, and we're not talking about the seal, that, the, the mammal, that sea mammal. So we're not talking about that animal. We're talking about, about a seal. So remember, a seal is something that so usually it was stamped on. So it embosses the paper. It was made out of metal, and you stamp it, and it raises the paper, and it's like an official seal. But it could be made up of wax seal, or sometimes it's your signature. I think Ms. Elaine showed us a signature. So that makes it official. So it's usually at the very bottom of it. So there's a seal, right? Or if you got a certificate in school, it usually has a little seal, maybe with your school uh, emblem or something like that. It just, and then the principal signature as a date and your name and the reason why you're getting in and then a signature. So that makes it official. So your, your principal has to sign it all, all those year after year, year after year. But such a wonderful thing was done that it required a much greater seal than this. And this is what the seal was. So uh, what do we say? Matthew 26, verse 28 says this, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. So what's the seal? The blood of the covenant. Whose blood? Jesus' blood, right? When he was on the cross. So the blood, life is in the blood, as the Bible says. So he gave his life. His blood was shed on that on the crucifixion. And he was crucified on that cross. His blood was shed. It needed to be shed. It needed to, it needed to happen. And Jesus knew that it had to happen. So when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked his father and his father assured him that this is what had to be done. And he was willing to do it. He was obedient to the end, to, to the last moment. He was always obedient unto the death of the cross. So he obeyed his father. He understood what he had to do. He accepted it and he did it for us, for you and me. So that's the seal. It was made official. So this covenant, this treaty, this pact, it was made, uh, it was made official by his blood. And it only had to be done once. No longer is this going to happen again. It was done once. It was done perfectly. It was done well. It was done amazingly. Now, the last question for us is, who is this covenant for? Now, in the past, the, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant was for the people of Israel. And unfortunately, it was broken and they didn't obey it. And they, they had to do all kinds of things all, all the time. They had to offer sacrifice and burnt offerings for the people who offered it and then for the people who were bringing it over. So it, it, was, it was okay, but we needed something that was the best. And that's what we learned today. What was the best? So what is this new covenant for? That was the last question. And our last slide shows us for whom it is for. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And I put a picture of the globe that just represents people, the population on earth, whether it's today, 2020, or whether it's 10,000 years from now or 10,000 years ago, wherever it may be, it's human beings that have lived on this earth. That's for whom it is Okay, so it's for those who believe in him, right? Now, let's go, let's read this again. Let's read it slowly, because I know some of you boys and girls just go, whoosh, say really fast. So, for God so loved the world, that's important, so loved the world. For God so loved the world, and this is the evidence of it, that he gave his only son, so he's saying it, now he's acting on it, he gave his only son, the only one he's got, that whoever believes in him, so whoever, what do they have to do? Believe in whom? In him, the son, God, should not perish but have eternal life. So they would not perish forever or die completely and be um, fallen short of the glory of God or be away from the Lord forever, but eternally the opposite, be with him, right beside him, right there in heaven. So believe in him. So we're finished for today, but I just want to leave you with a thought. Right here in John 3, 16, let's look at where it says believe in him. Because I could believe that somebody exists because I can see my, let's say it's my friend, the neighbor. I believe he exists. He is. I believe he is because I can see him. Maybe I believe him. You know, there's no need for him to lie about certain things. I believe him. He's an honest person. But do I believe in him? So then you see the three levels, right? So what the Bible is saying that we have to believe in him and to believe in him requires us first to believe that he is, then to believe him, what he has done and what he says, and it's in your Bible, 
And those two things together allow us to get closer to that we can believe in him. What, mean, what that means is, boys and girls, if I believe in him, it means I have believed in him so much I put my trust in him, that I put my life in his hands, I put my wife's life in his hands, I have kids, I put my kid's life in his hands, I put everything that I have, everything I am, in him because I believe in him. And that's very, very important. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come together tonight in the name of Jesus Christ, your Santa. Thank you so much, Lord, for everything that you are. Thank you, Lord, that what you have given us is the hope of salvation, nor that for all those who believe in you, Lord, that Bible promises that. So we thank you for that wonderful promise. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you, God, our Father, for who you are and what you have done. And thank you, Holy Spirit, of, what, of who you are and what you have done, Lord. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Lord, for everything, absolutely everything. Thank you for what you have given us. And thank you even more for what you have not given us because you are wise and you know what's best for us. Allow us to believe not only that you are, not only to believe what you've said, but to believe in you, Lord, to know not just the word of God, but the God of the word. In the name of Jesus, we pray and thank you. Amen. Wonderful. Two more lessons, boys and girls. Take care.